All right, so I'm excited about today. We're going to get into what Bethany Frankel now. She was on The Apprentice. She was on Martha Stewart, followed by what I sort of really know her as on The Real Housewives in New York City. Then she has spinoffs. Bethany Getting Married, Bethany Ever After. I think we've all heard, or if you haven't, she uh, created a brand called Skinny Girl. Sold it for millions and millions and millions of dollars. Skinny Girl, the drink, but she has Skinny Girl jeans and sold a massive amount of products. But I think the thing to talk about that with that is she looked at it kind of how I looked at FUBU in the earlier days. I looked at FUBU as something that I could put on all these music artists and their community was highlighting these things on these pipes, right? As we call it, using it for a commercial. But she was smart enough to do that where this wasn't new. Uh, When she negotiated her contracts, she carved it out without an attorney, carved it out that I can do skinny girl. Now, You don't have a lot of power when you're doing that, when you're first starting, because the way the networks and people feel is that if I do that for you, I have to do that for everybody. But there was something in the way that she negotiated, excellent negotiator. She would later on go on the Shark Tank, and I'm going to probably tell you a crazy story about that. But here it is. We're going to bring her on. Bethany Frankel, we're going to learn so much from her. Uh, Hopefully, you've been seeing her on TikTok being really hardcore and real in her own way, and now she's probably bigger and better than ever before. I'm excited. So let's get into it with my buddy, Bethany Frankel. All right, Beth, thank you so much for being here. Um, I've already uh, laid out, laid it out on how much, you know, I love and I respect you. And um, I want to just hop right into it. Um, you know, that moment, I want to go over special moments in your life that, um, you know, when you and I are out there having conversation with people, I'm sure they ask you the same things. What's your best investment on Shark Tank? How did you do this and that? And you could become just repetitive. All right. I want to go over where were you uh, now? I know that you were on several reality shows prior to to Housewives. Um, And then you're very private about many, many things of your life. What shifted and when was the moment that it shifted? Because, you know, to be on The Apprentice and Martha Stewart and various other things and then really carve out a very rare space in, uh, you know, Housewives all of a sudden you just really took a turn and said, I don't want to be in those type of worlds anymore. I want to create, even though I created a lot out of that world, I want to create my own. And and what shifted and why did you just say, I'm done doing it like that? I'm doing it now 100% on my terms. But that's so interesting. It's a great question. How do you know I'm so private? I love that you just said that as if like everyone knows that. I don't know that everyone knows that. How do you know that? Well, because I get enough information about a lot of people. And when we when you are. Uh, when you share certain things with me and we're talking, I know that it's not public information, not that you have said to me that don't say anything. But I just think that in the privacy of our conversation, you you know, you don't need to say those things and I don't need to say it to right. you. It, it just it's just a private thing. Yeah, I'm a very, <laughs> you know? very private like a fiercely private person, which is extremely confusing because I've spent a lot of my time on reality television. But usually that television is agenda based. If you're on The Apprentice, it's about your your relationship to the tasks and the other people. And they don't really care about all these things. And on The Housewives, it's really um, you're sharing what you want to. And sometimes it's some things that you wouldn't want to and that are uncomfortable because they might involve other people. Like I can control what I want to share and what I don't want to share. And if someone thinks because I'm seemingly forward, that still doesn't mean that I'm not private. When it gets to other people, then it gets uncomfortable. But um, but still, the show is about my relationship to the other women. So I just think that's interesting that you pointed that out because I am very private. And uh I left Housewives the first time after three seasons when it was the beginning. I mean, it was like, I remember this woman Mm. left ER years ago when that was such an important show. And you were thinking, how the hell is she leaving when it's like just getting hot? And the Housewives was just getting popular. I mean, it's been 20 years almost. uh, and And I left after three seasons, which I was a broke person walking on. So that seems nuts. But I don't know. I just had a feeling I was going to be on a spinoff and I just had a feeling I trusted myself. And so that time I just didn't want to be there. And I felt like I was cheating myself by selling out, by being there because it felt uh, toxic is the word that was swirling. And it really was the only word to describe it. And I went back after I had done kind of a rinse, like I wasn't really only known for that. Um, but it was part of my DNA and I left for three years and three seasons and I wanted to pitch something else to Andy and he pitched me to come back, which was like 
the Eagles Hell Freezing Over tour. And I uh, <laughs> thought about my relationship to the audience and my connection to them that I did miss. Uh, I also am not going to sugarcoat the fact that he offered me an unprecedented number for any housewife to ever mm-hmm. have been paid. So I, cause I said, I'm asking this number and I'm not asking to negotiate and it's one number and you say yes or no. And that's it. I'm on or off. Like we're not doing this dance and we didn't, that's very un Bravo, very on right. everywhere, but very un Bravo to say, here's my number. That's it. And they said, yes. And they, that was it. But then to leave the next time that was so much harder because I was being paid so much and exponentially increasing in what I was being paid and the show was more popular and I was popular and um, I was in a relationship with Paul, who I'm with now, and he's just calming and balanced, and it's a different type of relationship. And I wouldn't leave f- for him. He never asked me to leave for him. It just felt a little embarrassing in my life and a little with him. And uh, I remember calling someone very, one of the most powerful people in Hollywood and saying, like, can I be here? Should I be here? It feels weird being here. And he said, there's going to be a point and you're reaching that point. You may have reached that point where people are going to wonder what the hell is she doing in this scenario? Like, it doesn't seem mm. right. Um, hold on, I dropped something. Okay. Uh, where he said, it just feels like why, you know, you you did it. You were there and you were great and you came back and you came back big and the B is back. But we're going to get to a point where it's going to seem like you really just why are you there and why are you having these conversations? And not the, not a better than thing, but just a different than thing. So all these things were swirling in my head. And like, you know, when you want to break up with someone, you just kind of want to break up with them, but you don't do it yet, but you're looking for an excuse and you're nitpicking and like you want an out. Uh, I just was looking for reasons and you get less patient and you just have a, you have a, you have a lower tolerance rate for things that you just wouldn't tolerate. Like when you're doing a job and you're being paid a lot of money, you'll tolerate different things and you'll just do different things. Right. You're just, you're, you're on the West side highway and you're giving somebody a price and you're, you're, you're turning tricks and you know the deal. Right. Then there becomes a point where like, you're like, I don't know that I want to be this hoe. I just don't know that this is, there's a number for me to do this. Uh, cause this isn't really, you know, and, and it's fine. Prostitution is respected. It's a number. You get the service and there you go. I was, a, I was, I was a prostitute. So I took the Ooh. money and I did my job. Then I didn't want to do it and I wasn't going to do it well. And I just was like, you know, if it bends, it's okay. If it breaks, it's not. And it was coming back to a season and there were certain things in the negotiation. I got the money I wanted there was a deal point that I talked about on my TikTok that was not even important to me. It was something so inside baseball that Nene Leakes had been on the season before yeah. and she didn't shoot most of the season. So they missed a lot of scenes with her. And I had just had a, someone who died that in my life and I was coming back the next season. I showed up to work despite him dying. I wouldn't have even had to. And they put into my contract that if I don't, if there's, episodes that I don't appear in that I wouldn't be paid Mm -hmm. for them. And it would never have happened because the production company's like, we'd never air an episode without you in it. That would be stupid. The ratings had plummeted when I left, soared when I came back. They wouldn't do that. I already knew that from the production company. I just wanted an excuse. So when Bravo had a precedent, which it's their right to, I just said, I'm calling uncle. And I just walked. And that was the moment. Yeah. And it was a weird moment because my lawyers were like, what do you mean? They'll totally fold on that. You'll, the, it'll be the day of the game and the players aren't walking out on the field and they'll fold. I'm like, I know. They're like, you don't need to do this. And I'm like, I know. I know. I just want to do it. I want to fucking do it. I want to flip the switch. So I just flipped the switch. I, I think, that was the moment. I think that was powerful. What, what, what happens to people? And what do you say to those people? Cool. I think, oh, I know I've been there where you go, Am I looking at gift horse in the mouth? I know that I am not that I'm better than anybody else, but I'm here in my life. I'm I'm st- I'm getting either I'm really getting praise, I'm really getting paid really well. Um, if I leave, I may hurt other people that I care about in there, but I'm just not happy. And by nature, I want to grow and grow may not become being a bigger and better star. Grow may may become I could be more private in my life. And I could do it on my terms. Like so many of us are at those crossroads in life. And then we end up, as you said, 
We stay at that crossroad until sooner or later the shine is off for us and somebody goes, what the hell are you still doing here? Man, you must be thirsty. Oh, funny. You didn't yeah. see. Yeah. You know, like what happens? You know, like. It's true. What do we say to people right now who are at that crossroad with love, with family, well, with business, with their community, yeah. with politics? OK, let's break this down. A couple of things. Number one, Jerry Seinfeld said why he was he was offered he would have gotten more than a hundred million dollars from Brandon Tartikoff to do another season of Seinfeld. But he said there's a moment in an act where you're laughing, it's amazing, and if it goes on too long, you you, you get turned off and it ruins the whole experience. And I love that he said that. I just heard that. I once had dinner with Lauren Michaels, who's the producer of Saturday Night Live. He said to me, well, not about me, just about another. I listen to everything everybody says and absorb it. It's just like a recipe. It's crowdsourcing. He said, um, you have to make an exit to make an entrance. It was about one of his, Ooh. his, Lauren Michaels was talking about one of his SNL people saying, you have to make an, right. you have to make an exit yeah. to make an entrance. So that's just in my bank. But I wasn't even thinking like macro economics like that. I was just, just in my own life. But most people don't have the bank account to support that decision. Most people don't have yeah. the freedom to, 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 you know, to support that decision. I will say I'm not in that situation where I can't make a decision that I want to based on finances. But I will say, as a person who at that point had owned multiple homes, who had invested in multiple businesses, the nut had gotten bigger. You get, you know, when, when I used to have a, a $1,900 rent, that I couldn't pay. Like I knew what I couldn't pay. It was mm. one thing. Like the nut gets bigger and your business managers are like, listen to me, go back in one more season. What's the difference? It's millions of dollars. Let's just grab that. Cause you know, your, your, your skinny girl deal went on for 10 years. That's not happening anymore. That was my, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't as easy as you would think because I used to have numbers that would come in every year that were just guaranteed. And at that moment, mm -hmm. You know, I'm looking over at Paul, who's a wealthy man and my fiance, but it's like, am I going to dump my whole nut on you? Now it's your responsibility because I'm kind of leaving because of you. You didn't ask me to, but like in my mind, I wanted someone to like pick up the slack. Where's the show? My podcast, which now makes a lot of money because I have like five of them. Um, but I was like, I'm going to do a podcast. How am I going to put those numbers together? So I was thinking that I'm thinking it's going to be fine, but something we're going to have to cut it down a little. But when you jump, you fly. And I jumped and I felt it inside. And I now can say that I don't, that had to be what, two, three, I don't remember how many years ago that was. I, I have pieced together this perfect curated life that is exactly how I want it. This direct to consumer mm. model. And I make more money than I made then because I was truthful. I wanted to go figure it out. I had no idea. I had no plan. I've never had a plan in my life. I don't know how I'm piecing this puzzle together, but everybody get the fuck out of my way. Let me think. <laughs> and I'm going to do it. And I did it. And I'm here. And it's freedom. And it's like my way because I felt it in my body. So it wasn't starting over, but I didn't have housewives. I didn't have the skinny girl deal every year. I was kind of starting mm -hmm. over at this new level with the guaranteed money every year. And I did. I did it. And it's my own terms, completely every single iota of it. I walked away from HSN too. Same year. HSN was, 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 mm -hmm. you know, selling tens of millions of dollars of clothes on TV. I, I felt shackled. I felt shackled to all these different owners and I hated it. I hated working for HSN. I hated working for Bravo. I just wanted to go out and do my own thing. So that's the life that I have now. You know, a lot of people don't realize it, and I'm glad you brought that up. You know, if you are making a hundred thousand dollars a year, and uh, you know, you know, you know, that's your base, but you go to being unemployed for three years. I'm not sure how much money you save, but if you're making ten or bringing in fifteen million, and that money's coming in, you got some fuck off money. But at the end of the day, because you know that it's still coming in, going to keep coming in. But when you do make this jump or an investment where you go from bringing in 10 or 15 to losing two a year, even if you stacked up 30 or 40 million, I mean, you're going to turn around and go, you know, in five years, this two million dollars a year, that's 10 million less that I worked really hard to save. And whether it is from a monetary standpoint or just the feeling of growing, you feel it's scary. Well, because the number one you, thing that someone wealthy thinks about who's been successful, if they're smart, is don't touch the principal. 
don't touch yeah, the principles. Right. So you got the house, you did this other house, you could do it. You booked the vacation, you bought the car. Yeah. You know, you're not yeah. a crazy person. I am not, I never spent even close to more than I have, not even like within the stratosphere, but you bought a luxury item. You bought this, you did, which, you know, you were, you was going good. The music is now going to stop. So you're going to have to change your life, but yeah. you don't want to touch the principle. So the pandemic happens, yeah. your business changes, the whole shit goes out, whatever it is. You don't. So now you you don't you just want to not touch the principle. And this decision made me. And at certain points to do certain things, you're gonna have to touch the principle. That's the decision. How long? How long was that scare? Or was that uncertainty of that moment of everything you have? And of course, right? You gave it up, or you moved on, and you sold it. Was it two months, five months, two years? We were in the middle of a pandemic. How long were you in that kind of gray area of like I'm I'm trying to get into the jump rope. I know I will get into the double Dutch rope, but I'm. I'm stumbling a little bit and I'm not getting in there just yet. Was I was I was OK crazy. because I've always been OK because I did my first big deal and I had my first principle. Um, but, you know, I did have a different a home that I ended up selling in the city. It was getting to be a little swollen. And my you know business manager wanted more equity uh, money manager, more equity balance with the debt for like having a house and doing a mortgage because it was a smart thing. Another house is paid for in cash, like just sure. just measuring all the buckets and how it's going. And like, God forbid, and he would say, I want you set. You get hit for by a bus. You can't talk. You can't write. God forbid. You're just, you know, th we're very conservative in that way. So in that regard, I knew that also a lot of the spending that I was doing was smoke and mirrors because it's what's happening with housewives that don't have any money that they're all spending what they don't have because they think they're going to make it to catch up. They're not good business people. They don't understand taxes. They don't understand that you can't just charge yeah. everything on a credit card and it's going to be okay. And they're morons. So I'm not a moron. And I was like, okay, the music's going to stop now. I'm definitely not going to spend at the, at the same clip. I'm going to sell some things too. Like I didn't need to have three homes. I, in a, I realized in the pandemic, mm -hmm. I'm not in the city. So I'm going right. to make some moves and decisions, which felt like a good influx, refinance something else. Like it felt like a nice relief. I, I, it's not only just what you're making, it's what you're adjusting based on the climate. Like it's going to be cold outside. You're going to put a jacket on. So I'm going to brace myself now that I'm not going to be making it the same clip. So I'm certainly not spending it the same clip, but let's try to get back to where we were by selling something and like really, you know, cushion the, you know, pad ourselves. There was no thing I was nervous about, but I just want to be smart. Then one thing at a time just started happening because I was living truthfully and not out of fear, keeping all the houses and everything where you're living like freaking out about anything. You're calm, cool, collected, and you're just putting one thing on the board at a time. And it just, it, so right. it wasn't like there was a moment where I was like afraid. It was just, you're just making different moves. You're like, you know, on the battlefield and you're just making different moves. And I was always, I'm always making them, adjusting. So, so let me share uh, that moment with you, which would will bring it full circle. And I, I, I've already shared it with you, I believe. So, you know, I, uh, the Sharks and I, we were, I forgot what show we were at. You know, I, we ran into you. You weren't the most pleasant person, but I don't know why. Uh -huh. You know, you could have. Energetically. You Worst divorce yeah, in you history, 10 year divorce. That's why. Right. Something was yeah. going on. And, you know, not that you're supposed to be like, oh, my God, David Drama. You were just like. You and know, I might have been yeah, intense because you know. I was doing the competition. I was taking it seriously. You guys with the show. Who knows? Yeah. 100%. So they call me, they say, you know, we're thinking about bringing on Bethany and what do you think? And I said, well, let me let me check. I don't know much about her, but let me check. My wife was like, oh, my God, she's got to go on the show. She is so fast and so sharp and she's going to give you some shit that you do not expect. And so I called the producer. I said, listen, guys, I have the necessarily the greatest uh, interaction with her. Not that it was bad. I said, well, you know, I, I'd rather not be on the first panel with her because in case I lock horns with her because she's coming into a, a, a dysfunctional family, she's not a, she's not a punk. And I don't want it to come off as a man trying to beat up on somebody new or a woman or various other things. Or I don't want to come. You know, I'd rather not uh, do the show. Just you, you don't. know. So they put you on a separate panel. Next thing you know, you you're on the panel with me. And I, you know what happened? I think that I had, had um, met you and we talked and I was like, you know what? Uh, I don't ha if, if it falls out that way, being on a panel, order, I don't mind. So I remember a buddy of mine, Pete Vargas, said he was in the car with somebody and they were like, hey, we're driving to go see this guy. This guy's a real asshole. I heard. And he said, you ever met him? And he said, no, I never met him. And he said, well, if you didn't meet him and you think he's an asshole, you're actually the asshole. And I said to myself, when I got on the show with you, that panel, I said, let me think about it. In the break of that panel, I forgot what was happening. Mexico was something. You were on the phone going, if do not 
talk, call me unless you have a private jet and you are ready to send food. And I mean, you were working so hard for the for crisis of people, other people that you never met. And it was that moment that I felt like that asshole. It was that moment that I said to myself, this woman is doing way more than me for people that she doesn't know with the resources she has as busy as she is. I'm an asshole. You're not an asshole. You're getting um, an energetic vibe and maybe I'm intense and you took that as something else. Or maybe I was just being a bitch that day. But the headline, you that, you're I mean, reading a headline that I want to give a takeaway. You're, you're, you're giving takeaway about your side of it. I'm giving takeaway for people listening that you got to always try to like be nice to everybody or friendly because I could have not gotten on Shark Tank for that whatever vibe you got on you know, good morning, America. So people have to, I, I should always be alert about being extra nice to everyone around me. Well, and I appreciate that, but a hundred percent, I think we both can learn from it, but I, I want to get to the moment of many of us are too busy or we donate at the end of the day or do something else. When was that moment when you were seeing tragedies go on and you just decided the government's never going to get out of their own way. We have great people like uh, uh, Chef Jose Andreas who will be on the ground with food before anybody else. When did you decide during all the stuff you have, hey, you got a plane, you got shit. I know what you spend money on. I need clothes and food to go out there. When was that moment that you said, somebody like entrepreneur, somebody else is going to figure this out. You know what? Nobody's figuring it out. I'm going to figure this shit out. When was that moment? Uh, the moment is an, is another one that like evolved where I did something for Houston and started to, I'm always building the plane while flying it. It's just the way my look goes right now. I'm working on the series that is like a direct to consumer model, just like the podcast, which is a direct to consumer model. And I realized yesterday for the first time I knew it, but I've described it, but I didn't really put the light bulb on the way I do relief is also a direct to consumer model. It's no rubber chicken dinner. Beyonce's performing. You're going to pay in a circular reference and part of the mo like it's called money to the people. But I didn't know that wasn't happening. I didn't know that cash cards weren't being given to people after the ground zero of it all months later to rebuild the community. I didn't know anything just like I didn't know anything in business. One thing I say about the sharks, you guys are so smart and you've taught people a vernacular. Um, but like it's almost too smart a show for the average person who doesn't really know shit. Like I, I would never have been good on shark tag. I just like got into the ring on business and just like swam my way through to figure it out. That's how I did with relief. Like one step at a time, just being like, wait a second. No one's just talking directly to people and saying, hi guys, this is what's going on in this place, Puerto Rico or a Guatemalan, uh, volcano eruption or we don't have masks and PPE, whatever the thing is, I don't know what the hell is going on because they don't know what the hell is going on. So nobody should pretend they're an expert in relief or doctor. And I just was like, wait a minute, people that are big, that are taking people's money are so bulky and they take months to do the same thing that we could do in two days. So I was just right. like, let's just go direct. Let's figure this thing out. And we don't have to go to a government building in Puerto Rico and stand there with clipboards and air conditioning and coffee and talk. We just get on the goddamn butt, uh, truck and go bring the, the stuff and we'll figure it out as we go. So it kind of wasn't one moment like Puerto Rico was so big. It was, it was enveloping me and it was like $15 million. And I was like one person. I guess yeah. if I'm thinking right now, there was a moment when a very famous person, an A-list person, I, I, at this time, it's been so many years, I guess I could say Katie Holmes, like it was Paris Jackson, came onto my plane and said to me that they had gone to the big org, the big org with their money to say, we want to go do a relief mission. And that big org said, what? We don't know. So I'm, I'm saying, wait, wait, to the, I'm saying to Paris and hold on, you had $30,000 and you wanted to do a relief mission and the big org couldn't help you? What, I'm, who am I? I'm nobody. So I remember right. at that moment being like, this is fucked up. If the big multi-billion dollar a year in, can't, can't help mm -hmm. you get a plane into Puerto Rico and I can, then we are on to something. And we did the largest private relief effort in history, U.S. history then, and, and, and Ukraine was insane. So I realized we... That was a moment. Like I didn't know that that was the moment, but right now that was a big one because I was like, wow, we're doing stuff that no one else is doing.
but everyone's pretending that yeah. they are an expert on something. And that's the same thing in business. You can't pretend you're an expert because most things haven't happened. It's case law. No, hundred percent. And that's, and that's what I want to learn and, and take away from now. I want to, I'm like, you know, we, we have limited time and I want to just get, go to this one because there's very few people who are, can be as, as people without a filter, you and Barbara don't have filters. <laughs> Mr. Wonderful is one of the only people who can curse you out with a twinkle in his eye, like Santa Claus. There's very few people in the world that have this ability. And I, I am, hey, listen, First of all, I came from the hood where, you know, listen, everybody's trying to shoot, you know, shoot you, pimp you, whatever the case is. It's not like I have thin skin, but as you know, Shark Tank, you know, there's always somebody, a reporter who thinks they have a smoking gun every year. The story doesn't get picked up pretty much after they go, the sharks actually renegotiate a deal after hearing it. Or, right. you know, you got one or two, you know, sour puss in, you know, um, entrepreneurs who, and who, who, who break their non-disclosure we don't do it but how do you how do you combat as as raw as you are with the way that everybody's so goddamn sensitive as much as people want to do fight for you and love you because they say she's just going to give it to you the way it is how do you combat combat the the bullshit or the or the maybe it's not bullshit people who are offended people who think you did this think of the people that you did that how do you shutter that noise out or do you not do you go, you know what? Like you said with me with the begin just now, I should take some of this in consideration. Let me move the rest of this shit is crap. How do you deal with the people that reply to a lot of your unfiltered uh, insight? I don't like when it's too hot in the kitchen. I fly dangerously close to the sun and I'm okay with it being warm, but I don't like when it's too hot. It's just, it's not, it upsets the apple cart. I don't like it. I'm never afraid. The problem is I have a strong opinion and I want to say something. Um, it's just got to land. And I've, I feel that I've garnered the respect for the first time in all these years, I've garnered the respect of the media. Like they don't mess with me the way they used to. Like, you're like, you're, I don't know, you're a prize fighter or you're some athlete that like has to like fight it out for years with them for them to be like, all right, you know, she's paid her dues. Like, I can't explain it. Like, if you're in the first couple of years on a reality show, like, you're going to get your ass handed yeah. to you. Then it's, you know, your second show was at a one-hit wonder. You're going to get your ass handed to you. Like, I've been doing this for so long now that, like, I have a decent relationship with the media because it's a game. It's a dance. It's the ocean. You don't get in the impact zone. If you do, you're going to get beaten up. You wait for the good set. You ride it. And sometimes I get beaten up because I did. I took, I, I took a shot I didn't need to take. You know, I, I don't, and I'm not afraid, but like, I don't need to talk about Meghan Markle. It's not necessary. It doesn't do anything. Once in a while, right. I want to say something because I do feel that there's something to say, but it really doesn't affect my life. And if I do say something, there's going to be people that love it and hate it. And is that worth it? I don't need to talk about the Kardashians all the time. I'm going to say it once in a while if it pertains to fashion or if it pertains to my daughter and the influence that <laughs> that filtering and not telling the truth about things, if it affects her, that's something that might be a macro issue. But if I'm just doing it to just do it, it's not necessary. So I decide like in a flash, in an instant, whether it's worth it or not. And I just, I just let it ride. And I'd sometimes take a beating for it. It's, you know, by and large, I can take the beatings, but the beatings don't really like put me in the ground. Like they probably would have 10 years ago. It's just not the same. Cause I think I've got enough goodwill yeah. that it outweighs taking a beating. It's just not that bad anymore. And I'm also not on the housewives. So I'm not on shark tank either. Even shark tank is like, Housewives light as it pertains to shitty press because it's every second right. it's a factory of shit. But I'm not really yeah. on that shit front line anymore. And you're not either, but you're on like the lowest version of it, like the low grade version of it. And I don't, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm on TikTok. That's where I'm going to take a beating. Okay, I could handle that for a day. You know, I'm becoming more like you and Mr. Wonderful. I'm tired of this shit with the people. I don't I don't want I gotta have more intent. Instead of saying it nice and the people shark, I'm gonna go to the people I'm gonna go back to the hood people shark like yo. Shut yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, and by this the way, if you really period. commit and you're not afraid, it really works. If you really don't give a shit, which yeah. I often don't, and there's a place. The podcast is a different place to say things than TikTok, than Instagram, yeah. than television. You gotta know what party you're at. You have to know what room yeah. you're in because you say the same thing in four different rooms. It's going to land differently. 
that's powerful. So, you know, listen, I thank you for this journey. I think that we that I know that I I, I enter these things as trying to learn. Um, I love the fact that we we, you know, that moment that anybody may be going through or whether they think they're they're in the right place, they're at the right they're at the place too long, like you just said, you got an exit to yeah. make an entrance, or they're laughing all with you and soon they're gonna be laughing at you if you keep staying in that yes. damn in that damn place. And you gotta you gotta, you know, jump and then fly. I love that. I love the aspect of, you know, you turned around and you really did your analysis of what do I have as an entrepreneur to be able to go and help change the world as I'm looking at everybody else out there who is uh, getting bottlenecked. They got too big and bulky. Fuck it. I'm going to do it myself with the things that I have. And then as as crazy as it sounds, because, you know, I just think Barbara doesn't take her medicine and doesn't think outside the right. box of when she is flying too close right. to the sun. At least, you know, hey, oh, no, I'm going to give it to you. But you know what? There's certain things that I know. Eh, it's not that important. Like you said, I fly close to the sun. I don't get in the impact zone, but yet I'm comfortable where I'm at and I'm I'm not at the mercy of others. So thank you so thank much. You. For, and yeah, um, that one thing you everything. said, the second thing you said, you know, when you're at that club and it's like the lights start coming on, people's mascaras flying down their face like they should have left a half hour ago. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's the club. Like, to leave at the peak. The good song came I, I on. I tell Chauncey that all the time, Bethany, but he no. does not He's leave. He's out there with the busted girl with the mascara down her face at 3.45 a.m., and he should have left at 2.45, and that's late. I think I think she was there last mm-hmm. night. She, she saw you. All right. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you. I love you as love always. You I don't know how many people know how amazing you are. I think they do. I think maybe I was late to the race, but uh, I love it. And uh, and I look forward to seeing everything you, you consistently do and inspiring us. Thank great. you so this much. Great. This was a great interview. Good, good interview. And thank you for the good you questions. Got it. Peace. Awesome. Have a great day. All right. There you have it. As you can see, I go down this rabbit hole and I've learned so much from Bethany. I'm sure you have. But thank you so much for sharing that moment with me, Damon John. Thanks for watching. I wish you love and power in your life. Make sure you like, make sure you subscribe. Check you later.